said before, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, post-pandemic opportunities and predictions for the future. Like I said before, you know, many companies have really thrived during the pandemic. Other people have had some problems. There's opportunities, and we're going to talk about those. Let me tell you a little bit about our panel today. Len Miller. Len is the president of Len Miller & Associates, chartered here in Baltimore. His office serves clients headquartered in the Mid-Atlantic region who operate across the country. He specializes in sophisticated auditing, accounting, business consulting, estate and trust planning, and tax services. And like we said before, all those buildings downtown, Len probably has done the, uh, the uh, tax work for that. He also gets involved greatly with buy-sell agreements and mergers and acquisitions planning. He serves as an advisor to the board of directors of many, many companies here in Baltimore and in the region. Len, thank you, sir. Thank you. Steve Terramino, right here to my left. He's a keynote speaker, as well as the CEO of CCNA Strategic Media, a marketing and communications firm based here in Baltimore. Steve has done a great job. He's positioned his firm as a leading agency in the concept of market psychology and works with organizations throughout the United States, UK, and Germany. Those local, regional, international, he does it all. He's been interviewed by CBS and NBC regarding data protection and the privacy policies of Google and Facebook. Welcome, Steve. Teresa Bethune. She's the president of Info Pathways, a regional, regional technology support firm in Freedom Broadband, a rural internet service provider. Prior to earning these two companies, she spent her career at Johnson Controls, a really great company. She has served on state and local task forces, including the State of Maryland Rural Broadband Task Force, as well as several other local broadcast broadband task forces. She's a graduate of Johns Hopkins University and attended the University of Maryland School of Law. Welcome all three of you, Teresa. Thank you for being here. You know, like I said before, you know, there's been many, many opportunities as well as some problems, obviously, with the pandemic. Steve, how about you? Again, you would not only local, regional, national, you know, international as well with Germany and the UK. What have you seen particularly that has affected your clients? Well, it's the clients that saw uh, COVID not as a, a fear-based tactic, but opportunity that really did well, uh, especially in the world of advertising. So many companies, I would say probably 80% of companies when things started to shut down, they immediately shut down their advertising. And digital advertising is based on a bid situation. So you can outbid your competitors to, to get advertising space. So what happened is when other companies pulled their money out of that pay-per-click uh, area, it left this huge vacuum for someone to take the space and take the opportunity. And that, that created lots of opportunities, especially for home service companies, uh, whether it be construction companies or landscaping companies or uh, debt companies, from what I understand, were just absolutely flooded with work. So there was a lot of great opportunities for those businesses. And a lot of them did really, really well because rather than taking on the position of fear, they took on a position of there's opportunity. And, uh, and I think that's really what it is, people who saw the opportunity that really did well. You talked, I remember way back when, you talked about the things with Google advertising. A lot of people pulled back. That's right. You know, I think last year we talked about that. What are the opportunities now as a result of that? Well, we're, we're kind of back to normal uh, in that sense. So those opportunities don't exist any longer. Um, the opportunities right now are companies are still not, uh, they're not approaching what they do in a very holistic way. Uh, most organizations are saying, you know, I want to do pay-per-click ads or I want to, you know, do one specific thing. And doing one specific thing just doesn't work anymore. Uh, you don't see the results that you used to see from those things. So when you're thinking about communications, and I would urge everyone to start thinking about marketing and business development and sales more as communications than anything else. Because you need to approach people uh, in what I call five fundamental forms of communication. You need to approach them with a marketing message. You also need to approach them with an advertising message. There's reputation management. You know, there's PR. You know, there's all these different types of ways, including branding. And what happens is, when people see the same message from each one of those viewpoints, it creates a sense of trust that you don't necessarily get if you're seeing just one sort of message through one channel. So the opportunity really is to, to sit back and diversify and say, how are you approaching each one of those viewpoints? 
What are you doing in marketing, advertising, branding? What are you doing in PR? And what are you doing in reputation? And how are you addressing each one of those buckets? Very interesting. Teresa, talk a little bit about the virtual marketplace, if you will. I mean, so many, so many uh, businesses have pulled back, you know, had their, had their uh, workforce work at home, you know, and now it's coming back to, like Steve said, coming back to a normal. What have you seen with your particular company? What have you seen with your clients with regard to that? So I would say it was really hard for some clients to go full virtual, not because they didn't have the technology in place, but culturally they were not ready. But now we have a workforce that has worked from home for 15 plus months. And so, and I'm sure you've seen articles in the Wall Street Journal or the Baltimore Business Journal. Trying to get those people back is really tough because now they've realized how much they enjoy their family and they actually want to be home. And so um, a lot of what the experts are saying is don't be rigid and don't say it's going to be this way or that way, but you're going to have to work to, to kind of coach those employees back. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece, which is the technology side, it's going to be interesting to see what technology looks like because now, as the company, how much of the technology your people are using in their home do you own? Do you own their problems? Does your IT support firm own their problems if their internet's out? Uh, there are other <coughs> considerations. You know, is their workplace safe? If they injure themselves in their home office, is it going to go on your workers' comp? I'm not an attorney. I'm not an HR. I think more in terms of how do we keep things secure. But I will tell you, we're finding a lot of the home workers are having problems at home, and we have to have a conversation with our client to say, how far do you want us to go to support that home worker? Do you want us to actually physically drive to their home? You know, we have a, a, a lab, or I'm sorry, a pharmaceutical, where one of their key people went out to his place in Deep Creek Lake at the beginning of COVID. He still hasn't returned. If he has a problem, do they want us to drive three hours to go fix it because it can't, if, if he loses connectivity, we really can't help him remotely, right? Uh, those are the little things that haven't come out yet, and I'm sure that the Maryland State Legislature will come up with lots of great laws that they're going to want to pass relative to that home workspace because it's not going to go back to normal. We can say we're back to normal. We're all sitting here without masks, right? And we actually got to shake hands and we're fist talking bumps. You know, fist bumps <laughs> instead of the elbow right. bump, right? right? But the world isn't going to go back to the way it was before COVID. People are used to a new normal and there are a lot of uh, systems and processes and policies that are going to have to catch up with that new normal. You made a great point in terms of the work balance, balance of life, and there's been a change, obviously. And, you know, it's, it's almost a paradigm shift because from a businessman's perspective, if the work gets, still gets done, do we really care whether the or worker is at home or within an office? Len, how does it work? I mean, with your business, it's hands-on, you know, working with the client. Talk about that, if you will. We have two different cultures in our business somewhat. The people that work directly with me pretty much came in all the time. But our accounting auditing group, which lends itself very much to working remote, and we were remote before in the past because we didn't want to lose any kind of process during snow days or whatever. And so our accounting auditing people, they have worked basically, no, no, I have people that I hired remotely and I have never, never seen them since last February and other people work from me I have not seen in person uh, and and what happened there was these people what I, I did notice to your your point is that some of the people worked at home and I was talking to somebody earlier today about this the people who work from home we had to watch that they didn't kind of burn out we had one person who lived by themselves and we sensed that that person is getting very depressed because hmm. they were totally by themselves and wow. and and that type of thing. But we had other people, particularly the people who have young children, like three, four, five years old, where they were home with those children. And, and they started, like, near the end of this situation, started complaining, wow, this is really burning me out, you know, everything else. And we're like, what's happening is they get up in the morning, they take, they put, you know, get their children ready and they got to homeschool them. So they're being distracted by that. And they'll admit to you, a three or five year old, you can't ignore them. You don't want to. And, <laughs> right. and but they're, meanwhile, they have their work on their, their table and they're working. Then they put them to bed. And then eventually 
at night when they put them to bed, they're still working on this and they actually think, God, I'm just working all day long. But I even showed them their, their hours were no different than they were in the past, but psychologically, we had to watch that and that was a big risk. And, and I don't think some of those people are gonna to wanna to come back. I, my own wife who, who runs the A&A section, she's been there every day at the house and, and the dog's got neurotic because it, <laughs> if, if she, anybody goes out, she, the dog gets really hyper. And I bought her a sign the other day that said, one thing my dog and I agree on, I'm not going back to work. <laughs> you know, so anyway, but, but it's, it's just been a really interesting yeah. year and, and I don't think we're into where everybody talks about the new normal. I don't think we know what it's going to be because we're not there yet. I, I think you're exactly be. right. I don't Very think we, know, we don't know that for Where this all goes. And, for a and, fact. And you're right. You have to, you can't lose your key people. No. You can't. So. Without a doubt. I mean, people have the name of the game. Let me ask one or two more questions. We'll open it up to the audience. Steve, you know, you've really been virtual almost since your inception many, many years ago. Talk a little bit about that transition now and how it's worked for you, I guess, really from a positive perspective, because your people were already virtual yeah. and you're still getting the input from their from your So it, it was positive because we really didn't have to make much of a change. Uh, the negative is the rest of the world is catching up to us. So we're, we're not uh, on the leading edge, so to speak, in that. But, um, you know, when I think about, when I think about remote work, uh, you know, you said something that kind of rubbed me a little bit the wrong way, the idea of work-life balance. You know, I don't think they should be separate. You know, you don't have work over here and then life over here. I think a better phrase would be work-life integration. How do you live your life and do your work at the same time without them really hurting one another? Or if you can make it even better, help them amplify one another. Um, and that's something that, that we've worked on for quite a long time because, like you said, we've been virtual for, for a long time. And um, the key is really understanding who are the client-facing employees and who are the employees that are in the background that you know, get a lot of the work done but don't necessarily interact with the client. And the ones that don't interact with the client, honestly, it doesn't matter when they're working, where they're working, as long as they're meeting their deadlines, getting their projects done, uh, and, and, and so forth. The people that are working, that are client facing, that's a little bit different story because there are nine to five hours and you have to meet them sometimes and, and you don't want to be sitting on a beach when you get a, a Zoom call or something from the client, that wouldn't look too well. But, but it's about understanding the expectations of the client, it's about setting standards uh, and then making sure that you're, you're meeting what those standards are. Uh, the other thing I've noted over the years, especially with virtual workforces, uh, is when you have a new employee, they generally come with this idea that they have to do their job because they're you know, at the company. They're doing their job because the employer expects it. At some point, they make a transition. If you have good leadership, the employees then want to do a good job for their leader, not necessarily because of their leader. But eventually, there's going to be stressful moments that happen. There's going to be times when the employees have to meet a deadline and they're working overtime. And in those instances, if the leader decides to make those hard deadlines with the employee, it starts to create this sense of unification uh, and a loyalty because the leader is willing to get in the trenches, so to speak, with them. And then when you have that kind of relationship with the employees, uh, it, it just completely changes the dynamic of the company culture uh, and it just amplifies everything across the board. That's really the essence of what corporate culture is all about. If you can get your employees to work for you, you know, and, and really want to make a job, a good job for you, you've really crossed the barrier. And, and again, you know, whether you want to call it life work balance or life work integration, it's that combination of making sure that you're taking care of your life and you're taking care of your work and there's a happy medium. Teresa, anything else you want to add to that before we open it up to the audience? I like what Steve said around life work integration because I remember a salesperson I had working for me in my Johnson Controls days. He would come in every day and he would do his job, but he wasn't particularly exciting. He wasn't, he didn't seem particularly motivated and he was a salesperson. So that's not really what you want to see in a salesperson, right? <laughs> right. And he seemed really like nondescript. And he tells me one Monday that he was running in the New York City Marathon dressed as Braveheart. Hmm. And so I'm looking at him and I'm looking at this nondescript fellow and I go, you ran the New York City Marathon as Braveheart. And he said, well, yeah. He said, well, that's kind of crazy compared to the guy I see every day. He said, well, that's who I am. I said, well, why can't you be that guy here? <laughs> like, I want that guy here. And so I think that 
you know, the post-COVID-19 world, and one day maybe we'll stop saying that, right? People are starting to be more of who they are instead of who they think the company wants them to be. The question for us as employers is going to be, do they still fit with us or not? Not say that in a bad way, but is their uh, work-life integration now consistent with us still getting business results? And we're going to have to develop ways, better ways, and it can't be exactly what we did during COVID because most of what we did in COVID were emergency adaptations. We went from having meetings like this or going to sit in a customer's office to a Zoom call or a Teams call, and we all became very adept at using those video conferencing systems right. and collaboration platforms. We also probably got sick of it, got Zoomed out, right? I am. Right. Um, the first meeting I came to here, I was elated because there were real people in the room. Um, however, we can't keep using exactly what we did because now we have to kind of grow up and we have to kind of adapt to what does the world need to be. So whether it's our processes and our policies, how we're going to interact with our employees, whether we're going to make them come back um, or find a way that they can help decide how they're going to integrate into the office versus be working at home. But we're also going to have to look at our technology platforms too, not just from a cyber standpoint, which of course is mission critical, but you're also going to have to think in terms of uh, is it useful if there's a bunch of us in the room and there's a bunch of people remotely, do we have the right platforms in place to make it a meaningful inter interchange for everyone? Because nothing's worse than three people in the room crowded in front of a laptop with four people not in the room and you do not have productive dialogue. And so those informal things that happen in an in-person meeting, you have to find ways to integrate that into your hybrid workforce because without that, you're not going to have an effective meeting, but you're also going to affect that team dynamic I think Len talked about, which is you don't want somebody feeling uh, isolated, alone, uh, depressed, not part of the team. So it, we've got a lot of opportunities, but there's going to be some challenges as well. And there's a lot of wasted time that I saw because <clears throat> what, what a lot of people were doing it, and even our a a group, they'd have this like team call. First, they'd done it twice a week, and there'd be all these people on this whole Zoom call. Well, not everybody needed to be on there for the whole duration, and, and it just uh, chewed up a lot of effort and time and created a lot of stress and work disruption, and that was a problem. And the other problem we had was the IRS. IRS, there, nobody was there. That's I'm everybody's sure problem. Anybody there. <laughs> they're, they're talking about hiring 86,000 auditors. I don't know where they're going to find all these auditors in this <laughs> world because all the accounting firms like to be able to find them. But it's just been a you know a total disruption. We have cases sitting in appeals that are sitting there for two years, and we just file each 72s, which is an extension of statute of limitations, over and over again because who knows when they'll ever come to some kind of completion. It's just a, a big disruption this year. Problem with the IRS. Who has questions from the audience? Any of our, any of our panels? Individuals? Dave. I just did a session <coughs> with the Estate Planning Council, and it was an ethics like CE session. It was really interesting because some of the questions that were brought <coughs> up had to do with privacy. Mm -hmm. Many of us have you know, client relationships that um, are delicate, right? So now, there, there wasn't an aid, there wasn't a, there wasn't a consensus on how to solve this problem. Maybe, you, maybe you have some suggestions on this. But people are not only us are working from home, but our maybe our children, our adult children, are now working from home. And you're on a, a conference call with a client, or a Zoom call with a client, and they're talking, you're, you're discussing, you know, personal information that is really sensitive. And I guess, I guess the the whole concept was we need to be prepared as an industry, whether you're in the accounting industry, financial services industry, or any industry that has, medical industry that has you know, delicate information, how are you answering that to your customer? What what controls are you putting in place? That's a big problem and you need that. Can you rephrase the question yeah. for the uh, yeah. camera? The, the, the question was with confidentiality and when you're a consultant or any kind of business and you have very private uh, privileged information at your home uh, now because you, you are working from home. How do you protect that from being used improperly or the confidentiality? And 
And it's funny you raised that question because the, the Association for Certified Fraud Examiners just had a big meeting with 1,600 people. 71% out of that 1,600 people said that they, all, their, all, their, all they're seeing is increased risk of fraud. And 51% said that all their companies and their associations have already realized an increased risk of fraud. And, and if you, you can easily imagine it, if you're in the IT world, as you, as you point out, that if you have systems at homes that are not, you know, it's not a secure area, and we run into our audit where, you know, normally we hit a big client, they got their CFO and their CEOs there and everybody else, and the system's there. This year when we did an audit, none of those people were at the company. Some of them didn't have access to systems from their home. Some did. And it got to be a real, real drag on everything. And, and you're 100% you're correct. It's a tremendous risk that somebody could see something. And you had some families where other family members were living with them too. So you, it's really tough to protect that information. But you do need to watch out for this because fraud is going to be on the uptick a lot because of that. Because how do you how do you protect it? And some of the people in this room could probably answer that very well. But you, you know, it's a risk. You see the increase in all this uh, uh, ransomware. Right. Look how that's jumped. You know, it, it's it, it's an interesting year. So. I would add. Okay, it was said earlier by a gentleman here. Training, training, training. You have to train your employees. And if you are the sole proprietor or you are the employer, you have to take an active role in training them, not just on proper procedures around privacy and confidentiality, but also around phishing and things like that so that they aren't putting your data or your customer's data at risk. And the, 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 um, what you described, where you have multiple family members working in a house, you've got to use common sense and say, okay, well, what do I do for a living? I'm working with people's really uh, private information. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to go work at Panera, son. You know, you're going to have to go sit at Starbucks to do your job because your job doesn't deal with personal information. And I know that's a harsh thing to say, but you've got to be realistic around what you do and find a way to make the accommodations because that home office is something that your employer can't control. They can tell you here's our policy. They can put the, uh, the technology protections in place, but they can't make you not sit there with your wife and show her, you know, some scoop on somebody you know, right? Um, and that, that's the piece. You know, we talk a lot about policies. When we are dealing in the biotech space, they are governed very strongly by policies, that if they violate those policies, bad things happen. And that's what happened at, say, the emergent plant in Baltimore. They did not comply with their own policies. What was it, a half a million? doses, or half a billion, like 500,000 doses of the J&J &J vaccine, gone. All it took was somebody to not comply with the policy they had. And so whether that's private data, whether that's, uh, you know, FDA protected data, whether it's just how you're behaving, you've got to, there's only so much that your employer can do. There are decisions you're going to have to make as a professional that uh, would drive that as well. And, that, and that you're right on that because it always rests with you as the professional. But you think even in this room, everybody you dealt with, whether they were an investment you know, advisor, whether they were a banker, an attorney, whatever, they were all working from home. That's they right. all didn't necessarily have secure systems and things like that. Or can, you know, so it is a big risk and it's something you just need to address and try to control. Training, training, training. Well put, Teresa. Any other questions for the distinguished panel here? Silios. So let's um, talk about innovation. Because if you go back way in the days, you had folks on graphic boards. People would walk by. They would start an in informal meeting. They would come to a quick decision on something. They would spark each other by not even scheduling a meeting. And then all of a sudden we had these scopes and air-conditioned rooms, right? And the people were disconnected. Now we're one step removed. How, is, how are you going to have remote folks and folks in the office truly interact and help each other truly innovate beyond? That's a problem. Because it's not a it's not a half an hour, 15-minute session. It's it's just sporadically happens. When two people click, 
on an idea. So how are you going to do that? Rephrase that for there. Yeah, that's that's actually a problem. Rephrase the, rephrase, rephrase. the question was, how do you have a collaboration where you have professionals? Because that's one of the things we rely on. If you came to our office, Steve's wife could tell you, you would think we're, we're arch enemies because we fight over things. And our, <laughs> our, role is, our role is we argue and fight and debate and deny that the other person's got the right answer until we're sure that you know, we're all in, concession, you know, in agreement that this is the approach. And that's tough to do on the internet or anything of that nature. And the other problem that you made me just think about, Vasilios, is this remote. You need to watch because a lot of people, it's easy for us to recognize this, but if you're not like in the tax world and all, you have employees in another state and they're working in Colorado or wherever. Colorado's got its own, its own issues right now. But if they're working someplace else and you're paying them, you have nexus so you have you have depending on that wage level for each state by state you may have nexus meaning that you are going to have to file possibly payroll reports and help withhold taxes you're going to have to allocate your taxable income to those various places you do business and you don't want to get trapped because if you don't file in most states by almost every state there's no statute of limitations running. Wow. So they can go back forever. So you need to be very careful. In some of these states, the, tax, the interest rates are so high, it'll make the tax look like nothing after a few years. So I'm glad you reminded me of that. And to talk a little bit about that, Basilius, I think there's a generational aspect to that as well. Um, there are people that work at my company that have relationships with others that they've never met in their lives. They've, uh, they've only chatted with, they've had Zoom calls, FaceTime, and um, they probably never will meet actually face to face. So I think it's about the environment that you're used to. And if you're really used to that environment, which, which some are, creating those uh, moments of creativity and, and having those spurs of, of what, what are basically inter, interrelational behaviors isn't difficult for them. I think for us, the people that are used to doing these things face to face and having those spur of the moment conversations, it's a different story. Uh, but I think that's slowly changing as certain generations enter the workforce. Older people versus the new generation. Gary, you had a question. I, yeah, I, I had a question about uh, what I think is something that's human nature, especially for an employer, and that is a personal bias favorably towards a worker, an employee, that comes into the office as opposed to an employee that works out of the office. And so I, I guess I'm looking at it from, you know, I think it's just human nature for us to have relationships with people next to each other, close to close, working. And when it comes time to, for an employee to either, or an employer to think about moving up in the company, uh, you know, accepting more responsibility, isn't it human nature for an employer to want to give that to an employee who works close with them, as opposed to a remote employee? Or should we be not categorizing remote workers as such a ceiling, close workers, how do we deal with that as employers? Rephrase that question, whoever wants sure. to. Sure, so the question was asked, how do you balance you know, against personal bias towards the people that are in the office versus people that are not working from the office? And I'm gonna say that we are a bunch of old dogs that have to learn a new trick, right? <laughs> we have to adapt, and we have to adapt for not just because we have now people that wanna work remotely. We have to adapt because the generations behind us, so I'm looking around the room and there's probably one Gen Z here, maybe a millennial or two, and a lot of us are either Xers or Boomers, okay? The Xers and Boomers are more biased to this, and I usually have my phone, but I left it on the, the uh, table for a reason because I didn't want to be doing that, but the Millennials, <laughs> their first technology was an iPod, so they are not as quick, they, they, they are very tech focused, but they use it differently than the Zoomers. If we don't adapt to how we interact with our employees <laughs> and be able to interact and use the right technologies, use the right uh, processes. Like, you've got to change how you operate to not just embrace this remote workforce the same as you do the person that's there, but you also have to do it because the generations behind you, they're living their world in that phone. They're not living their world the way we are. And so we have a lot of work to do to 
harness the energy of the generations behind us. The millennials have certainly been, you know, we, we've heard a lot about millennials, right? Ever since millennials started in the workforce, we've all heard about it. So we have a really good idea of what a millennial is and what, you know, what are the things that make them tick and what are their generational attributes. They're just starting to talk more about the Zoomers and then the alphas behind them. And so we've got to adapt. We've got to be able to leverage things like whether it's Zoom or Teams, knowing that we've got to be able to reach out to people, knowing that maybe the best way to interact with them is chatting through something like Teams, okay? Maybe that's the best way to interface with that particular employee, but we've got to build relationships in a way that is going to require on our own digital literacy. So if you're not digitally literate, if you're going to stay relevant in your workforce, you're going to have to. So I don't know if that answers your question, but a lot of it is we really have to adapt and change. Well, and to your point about human bias, that's a two-way door. There are people that, um, there's probably people that you've worked with that went to this remote and you're probably thinking, thank God I don't have to see that person every day anymore, <laughs> <laughs> right? But that person's in your company because they do a great job. So having that, that performance there, but not having to deal with maybe some of the other negative things that come along with uh, seeing that person every day, that's an advantage for, for that particular person. So bias can work both ways. Yeah. But I also think that with collaboration, that there's a lot to be said that if you're sitting there with a group of people and you're dealing with an issue and the body language and the connectivity and the spontaneous aspect of it. And I don't think in a lot of cases, somebody's gonna grab the phone and, and call up this person, that person and start doing a poll. They're, they're gonna probably decide their own decision and not have a debate. So I think that is still at risk. And, and I watched my grandson talking about technology. I was talking to my wife the other day and I said, it's quite interesting, their grandsons meet the girls they date on Snapchat. <laughs> and they've never met these people before in person, but yet they become friends and yep. start dating and it's just a different world. So I think as generations age, you're gonna see a change over and we won't be the dinosaurs, you know, but I think <laughs> that will naturally change because of the technology that they know that we don't know and their comfort with it. I honestly hope we never get to virtual dating. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows when that's coming? Final question. Steve Goldberg, final question. Vaccines. How are you guys handling vaccines where uh, employees don't want to get vaccines? You want them. I mean, I know personally, a company in Baltimore, 500 employees just fired 100 of their employees for refusing to get vaccines. Sound like lawsuits. Uh, sounds like lawsuits. Sound. That's what Steve. I thought, but they. So, so the questions about vaccines and how are organizations requiring or not requiring vaccinations, uh, and I'm assuming you mean specifically to COVID, and right. you know, um, you know, at this point, I think that the vaccines are out, and people can make a decision if they want it or if they don't want it. It's not a situation anymore where there's not enough supply for demand. Right. So, when you think about it from that perspective, you've either made the decision to take the risk of getting COVID or you've made the decision to take the vaccine to avoid getting COVID. Either way, you've made a decision to do something. And when people have the ability to have free will and make those decisions, you know, corporations shouldn't re require you know, those vaccinations unless there's some other, you know, other client that is requiring them. For example, if you're working in hospitals and in order to keep the contract with a hospital, your employees have to be vaccinated, that's a different situation. But as professional service providers, I, I don't think it should be required. We took the same path. So we are not requiring the vaccine. We heavily encouraged it. So the minute we knew we could get vaccinated as a team, we heavily encouraged it and even told employees where to go, where we felt they could most likely get a vaccine. I have three employees that are absolutely opposed. Wow. And what I have said to all the, the three are, if we get to a situation where you can't work for our clients because you're not vaccinated and I don't have any place for you to go, then I can't employ you any longer because I can't send you to any customers to do work. And so um, it's not something you want to say. You know, the one, the one gentleman, my joke with him was, I said, what will happen is you're going to fight getting vaccinated and if it gets to a point where I can't send you any clients, I will have to fire you and then you'll die of poverty, not from COVID. <laughs> and he, I know he thought that I was joking, but I was half serious. Um, again, it's personal choice. We're not going to require it, but we've encouraged it. Any final thoughts on that, Len? You agree or disagree? 
I think it's a, a sticky wicket because to your point, Vasilios, if, if I tell them I'm going to fire them if they don't get vaccinated, what happens if another employee uh, that's working there gets exposed and, and somebody there had it that they work with and they claim that you exposed them to that? Could you have legal action on that front as well, that you put them at risk and it was your fault? So how, how do you win that game? I think it's like you're going to be damned if you do and damned if you don't, in my mind. So Interesting thought. Thank you all for coming. Have a great summer. Thank you, our panel.